In this lesson, we're going to remove some duplicate code that we currently have in the player, monster, and trader classes. If we open up the solution and take a look, in the player class, we have a name property, we have a hit points property, we have gold, and we have inventory. Then we also have some functions to add items to the inventory and remove items from the inventory. In the monster class, we've got a name, maximum hit points, hit points, which is their current hit points. We have a reward gold, which is basically the amount of gold they have on them. And we have the inventory property. And if we look at trader, we have name, inventory, and we have some functions to add and remove items to the inventory. That's a lot of duplication or near duplication. So what we're going to do is create a new class that's in the engine models folder, and it's called living entity. And this is basically going to be used as a base class for anything that's alive, a monster, a person, a player, an NPC. We may expand this later in the future, but right now it's just monster player and trader. The living entity class is going to inherit from base notification class because we still want to have the ability to use the on property changed event. And we're also going to make living entity an abstract class. This means you can never instantiate a living entity object. You can instantiate a child that uses living entity as its base class, which is what the player monster and trader classes are all going to do but you can never instantiate a living entity class on its own. Inside this class, we're going to have the name property with its backing variable underscore name and its property changed event. We'll have a current hit points property, a maximum hit points property. This is going to be used so that you can never heal to more than your maximum hit points. So if you're a first level player and your maximum hit points are 10, you take three points of damage and you drink a potion that cures five points of damage, it's only going to move you up to 10 as your current hit points, which is your maximum hit points. It's not going to move you up to 12. We'll also have a gold property, an inventory property, and we'll put in a weapons property. We have our two functions here for adding items to the inventory and removing items from the inventory. We just grab these from the player class. And in the constructor for the living entity class, we've made this protected. Protected means this function or this property or a variable, anything that's protected can only be seen by the child classes. So player, monster, and trader will have access to the living entity constructor because they're all going to be children of living entity and children can see protected functions, but nothing else will have access to it. This is another way you kind of limit the ability to instantiate living entity objects, which we also can't do because of the abstract. Now that we have the living entity class, we're going to go and make it the base class for player, monster, and trader. I'll do that by copying the name, going into the player class, and instead of having player inherit from base notification class, it's going to inherit from living entity. And because living entity inherits from base notification class, player will still have access to all of the functions in base notification class. The player can see the functions in its parent and in its grandparent. We'll do the same with the monster class and with the trader class. Now, if we look down here in the error list, we've got a lot of errors because we have duplicate properties. Now we have the same property in player, monster, and trader that we have in its parent. So we'll go and remove those. The player class doesn't need the name anymore because that's in the parent living entity. It doesn't need hit points because we're going to use the current hit points instead. 
It doesn't need gold. We're going to use that from the base class. And it doesn't need the inventory or the weapons properties because those are both in the base class. And we can get rid of the add item to inventory and remove item from inventory functions. If you take a look, you see there's some squiggly lines underneath those functions. And if you hover over them, it says this function is hiding an inherited member. So it's saying, Hey, you've got one of these in your parent class. You don't need it here in, the, in this child class. Or if you specifically want to overwrite the one in the parent class, you need to, you need to add public new so that we know this is a new function, a new version of add item to inventory but we don't need it in the player class. We're just going to use the base one so we can delete add item from inventory and remove item from inventory. Now we can go into the monster class, do the same thing. We're going to take out the hit points, name, and we're going to take out reward gold because we're going to use the gold property instead. We'll take out the inventory, and then we'll go to the trader class, take out name and inventory and take out the two functions for adding items to inventory and removing items from inventory. But if we look down in the error list, we've got some more errors. That's because we've changed the name of some of these properties. Uh, in the monster, we had reward gold and now we're just going to use gold, but the rest of the program is looking for reward gold. So we're getting errors. So let's take a look at the player class. Looks like everything here is good. We don't see any red squiggly lines under anything. Let's look at monster. Ah, okay. Here's hit points. We're setting the monsters hit points property to the past in the parameter, but we don't have a hit points property anymore. Instead we have current hit points property. So we just need to change the name there. And it's the same thing for reward gold. We don't have reward gold as a property. Instead we have gold and we can also get rid of this inventory initialization because that's going to be handled in the living entity constructor here on line 61. We're going to initialize the inventory there. And it looks like all of our errors are gone from the monster class. I'm also going to take out I'm going to remove this using statement on line one. We don't need this here anymore. It's handled in the living entity class. I'll check the player class. We might be able to do the same. No, we can get rid of the inventory initialization in the player class constructor on line 51, but we still need to have the using statement because we have the quests property. Now, if we look at player, that's all good. No errors. Monster looks all good. Let's go to the trader class. We can get rid of the inventory initialization in the constructor there, and we can get rid of the using statement. It looks like all of our models, the player trader and monster class are all good now. So now we have some errors in the game session class, and we're going to have some more in the UI. So let's take a look at game session and fix the change property names in here. If we scroll down in the game session constructor, when we create a current player, we're saying hit points equals 10. We need to change that to current hit points equals 10. And we also want to add in maximum hit points equals 10 because now we're recording both properties. If we go a little further down here in the attack current monster function on line 228, when we change the monster's hit points, because we've damaged it, we're still referencing a property called hit points. We need to change that to current hit points. And on line 250, when we check the Monsters hit points. We need to change that one to current hit points. 
if the player has defeated the monster, then on line 258 and 259, we give the player the gold. We used to call that property on the monster reward gold, but now we just use gold, so we need to change those from reward gold to gold. On line 261, we've got a loop here where we were looping through the monster's inventory and giving the items to the player. Now we've got a little problem here because the monster used to be holding item quantity objects, which would have an item ID and a quantity. Now we're using the inventory that's in the base class and living entity, which only holds game items. So we need to change this loop here from 261 to 266. Instead of being an item quantity, we need to make that a game item. And we'll do control RR, which is what I've got so I can rename a variable. And we'll change it to game item with a lowercase g. We don't need line 263 anymore because this is where we were creating the game item object from the old ID. We can just delete that because we're just going to give the game item to the current player. So this new line 263 will be current player dot add item to inventory game item. So we're going to take the item out of the monster's inventory, give it to the player. And for the message, since we're only going to give one item at a time, we can get rid of this game item quantity and we'll replace it with the word one. And for the name, we'll do game item dot name. So now we'll get all the items out of the monster's inventory, give them to the player, and raise the message saying you receive one whatever. If we go down a little bit further, we have what happens if the monster is still alive and attacks the player. So we've got some errors because we have current player dot hit points, and that property is now current hit points, so we need to change that name. And we do that on 282, 289, and 292. So that's all of the error messages in game session that are now fixed. But if we look down at our error list, we see in our monster factor, we, we have an error because it says cannot convert from item quantity to game item. If we double click on that error, here's where we're adding the loot items to the monster's inventory. We used to be adding item quantity objects to the monster's inventory. Now we're only adding game items. So we need to change line 48. So for the monster's inventory, we're going to add a item factory dot create game item item ID. And what this will do is now this will create an actual new game item and add that to the monster's inventory. But we also have in the living entity class, we've got this add item to inventory function. So let's use that. And we'll just say monster add item to inventory. And then we'll add the item that's created by the item factory. Now, if we look down in our error list, it's all clean, but there's still one thing we have to change. And that's the main window.xaml. Unfortunately, the error list usually doesn't show problems with XAML. Those errors usually only get detected when you run the program and Visual Studio isn't always good at picking up the changes, but we'll go down to the player's detailed information. And on line 53, we see the squiggly line underneath current player dot hit points. It says cannot resolve the property hit points. That's because it's now current hit points. And if we scroll down a bit, looking for any more squiggly lines. Okay, we've got our current monster hit points. We need to change that. So now that says current hit points.
And I think that is all the changes we need to make. So let's run the program and see if it works. We'll go up to where we need to fight a monster. And we see the player's hit points are 10. The snake's current hit points are 4. When we attack, the snake's current hit points drop. The player lost 2 hit points. Let's fight a little bit more. And we see the player's getting some inventory items. So the inventory is being updated. And the player's gold is being updated. So it looks like everything works. Since it all works, now's a good time to save to our version control, which hopefully you're using. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to say commit. Lesson 10.1. Refactoring player monster and trader properties to living entity. So now that we know everything works, we've got this checked in. If we make any future changes, we can always go back because refactoring moves a lot of things around. You don't want to refactor and fix bugs or refactor and add new features. Because if, if there's an error, you don't know, was it the refactoring? Was it the bug fix? Was it the new feature? Just do the refactoring on its own. Save to your version control once you know it's working. And then move on to your next step. I'll include a link below the video to the source code on the support page on my site. If you have any questions, please leave a comment there and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks.